Hey everyone, my name is Tim Locks, and this is the Solid State Workshop. This video is called An Introduction to Simple Electric Circuits, and it's really for anyone who thinks they might be interested in electric circuits. This is the third edition of this video, and I'm hoping that this one fills in some of the gaps of the previous two videos. And I know this video is pretty long, but I'm going to try to make really good use of your time. So if you're up for it, let's do it. All right, here's the game plan for today. First, we're going to walk through an analogy to help set the stage for what's to come. Then we're going to compare that analogy to an electric circuit, and we'll see what they have in common. Then we're going to discuss the physics of circuits from a conceptual perspective and without getting lost in too much of the details. Then we'll introduce one fundamental equation that will get you uh, way farther than you think, and it's actually really easy. And then we'll talk a little bit about circuits in the real world. And finally, we'll go over how to make some basic measurements in the lab. So I hope you stick around because uh, I think it's going to be fun. Okay, so sometimes when you're trying to conceptualize something new, it's helpful to put it in terms of something you already understand, something a little more relatable. So in this case, a popular analogy to the electric circuit is the hydraulic circuit. And a circuit is really just a closed loop. And hydraulic just means to do with water. So it's really just a closed loop to do with water. And I think most people already have a pretty good understanding of how water can be moved and controlled. But as we go through this, just pay careful attention to how we define each of the elements in the hydraulic circuit. All right, so here is our hydraulic circuit. And on the left, we have a pump. And on the right, we have a valve. And connecting the two is some piping. And note that that piping is completely filled with water. So if we were to turn this pump on and we kept the valve completely open, meaning not obstructing the flow of water at all, then the water is going to move really quickly through our circuit. And that's exactly what we see here. And if we reduce the opening of the valve to say 50%, then the flow of water will be reduced proportionally, just as we'd expect. And finally, if we were to close the valve even more so that it's barely open, 25% in this case, then barely any water is going to flow. So I'm sure that was all painfully obvious to you, but just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, so when we talk about more or less water flowing in the circuit, we're really talking about the flow rate of the water in the circuit. And in this case, it's the volume of water which flows through some point in the circuit in a given amount of time. And here, our point is really a, a cross-sectional sliver of the pipe, and we're calling that K. So uh, flow rate, as we can see up top here, is defined as the, the change in volume through our uh, sliver K and in some amount of time. Now we're going to say that each one of these circles here, that represents one liter of water which is, by the way, equivalent to about 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 25th molecules of water. And why that really matters, well, we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, to determine flow rate, all we need to do is to count how many liters of water pass through K in a given amount of time. So let's, let's turn the pump on and see what we get. Uh, but first, let's get our stopwatch out, actually. And uh, now let's see what happens when we turn the, the pump on. So one liters, two liters, three liters, four liters, five liters, and five liters of water passed through K in, as we see in our stopwatch, in five seconds. So since flow rate is the delta volume over the delta time, 
all we have to do is divide 5 liters by 5 seconds and we get a flow rate of 1 liter per second. So that's flow rate. Easy. Now let's talk about each part of the hydraulic circuit. And again, this all might seem like super obvious, but I think it's important to explicitly define what each part does to get the most out of the analogy. So the piping. The piping contains the water. Wherever the piping goes, the water flows, obviously. And for the sake of this analogy, we're going to assume that the pipe does not hinder the flow of water. It simply allows the flow of water, but doesn't get in the way of it. All right, next up is water. And we know that water is the substance that flows through the circuit. Didn't need me to tell you that, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, uh, the flow of water is what allows us to do useful work. And we know that from thousands and thousands of years ago, from the Mesopotamians all the way up to recent times where you have hydroelectric dams. We know that it's the movement or the flow of water which can allow us to do some useful work. Moving on to the pump. So the pump gives water kinetic energy and accelerates it through the circuit. And some people will say that pumps create pressure, but that's not true. Pumps create flow, and pressure is just a side effect of flow. So uh, flow rate can be modified by adjusting the applied power uh, to the pump or simply selecting a different sized pump. So if we want to make the water uh, move more quickly through the circuit, we just increase the power that we apply to the pump. So the key takeaway here is that the pump is the driving force in our hydraulic circuit. Because after all, if there was no pump, then there would be no movement of water. Finally, let's talk about the valve. The valve's job is basically exactly the opposite of the pump. So a pump creates a flow of water while a valve limits the rate of flow of water. So a valve which is completely open just looks like another segment of pipe uh, from the perspective of the pump. Conversely, when it's completely closed, no water can flow at all. So we can adjust the valve to somewhere in between completely open and completely closed to fine tune exactly the rate of flow that we want. So if the pump power is held constant, then the flow rate depends entirely on how much the valve is open. And the opposite is also true. If the valve's opening is held constant, then the flow rate depends entirely on how much power we apply to the pump. Okay, so hopefully that was all kind of logical and intuitive. And now let's move on to the electrical world and see if we can make sense of that. Okay, before we jump into electric circuits, we kind of have to get familiar with the rules of this new universe first. New universe first. Um, anyway, but uh, probably the first thing we should talk about is the idea of electric charge. What does that mean? So all matter is composed of tiny fundamental particles, and these particles can quote unquote feel each other's presence even if they're not physically touching each other. And the charge of a particle basically determines how it will act in the presence of another charged particle. So we say that a charge can be either positive or negative. But those names are kind of arbitrary, and they don't really mean anything if we're talking about a single particle. What we really care about is if we have two particles which have the same charge, or if we have two particles which have different charges. And that's because particles of the same sign repel, while uh, particles of opposite signs attract. And electric circuits, as you'll find out, 
are made possible by the fact that these charged particles can be repelled and attracted. Electric circuits deal with electrons, which are the negatively charged particles which orbit in atom's nucleus. And on the left over here, uh, they are these yellow uh, circles. And the unit of charge is the coulomb. And we use a capital C to denote the coulomb. Uh, more precisely, the coulomb measures the magnitude of electric charge which is basically measuring the quantity of charged particles. Uh, so yes, a single particle can be either positively or negatively charged, but say you have a whole bunch of charged particles, then you can quantify the amount of charge you have by putting it in terms of coulombs. So for instance, you need 6.2 times 10 to the 18th electrons to make one coulomb of charge and a coulomb's worth of electrons is like a liter's worth of water molecules so the water molecules are basically the smallest amount of water you can have is one molecule of water and an electron is these one electron is the smallest amount of negative electric charge that you can have but if you have a lot of either of those uh, you can put it in terms of coulombs, or you could put it in terms of liters, if it's water. Okay, so now let's talk electric circuits. A simple electric circuit is a lot like the simple hydraulic circuit we've just looked at. So, in the next couple of slides, we're going to take a look at the components of an electric circuit and see how they compare to the components of the hydraulic circuit and uh, as it turns out they are quite similar and if we take a look at these two drawings on the screen right now we see that the pump is correlated to the battery and the valve is similar to something called a resistor and the water filled pipes are similar to the conducting wires in an electric circuit so we're going to take a look at all those and see kind of how they're the same. Let's talk about the wire first. So a pipe containing water is similar to a wire containing electrons. So in the hydraulic circuit, we were interested in moving water around. But in an electric circuit, we are interested in moving around electrons. And the big difference here is that a conducting wire naturally contains a ton of quote-unquote free electrons and thus do not need to be added to the wire. And you might know that most metals are conductors of electricity. And this is basically because metals in general have free electrons. And if we don't have free electrons, then we basically cannot conduct electricity. Now, if you're wondering why some materials have free electrons and others do not, here's some rationale behind that. And basically, we're just trying to say what makes something a conductor versus an insulator. And if this doesn't really make sense, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a quick side tangent. So we know that in an atom, negatively charged electrons orbit a positively charged nucleus. And some elements have more electrons than others. As the number of electrons in an atom increases, the electrons are forced to spread out farther and farther away from the nucleus. And we call the electrons which are the farthest away from the nucleus the valence electrons. So if we take a look at this copper atom on the left over here, we see that it has one valence electron, and that's in green. And the nucleus of a copper atom has a very weak pull on this electron, right? We know that opposite charges attract uh, so that the, the nucleus will be pulling on all these electrons. But uh, the pull on this valence electron is really weak, and that's partly because it's so far away from the nucleus and partly because all of these inner electrons are, quote-unquote, shielding the valence electron from the effects of the nucleus. 
And because of this, the valence electron of copper can really, really easily be dislocated from its parent atom, and it might jump to a neighboring atom instead. And so we're, since we're interested in moving around electrons, it is necessary that we have these so-called free electrons, like we have in copper, which can move around and be manipulated. Now, by contrast, if we look at an element which is an insulator, uh, sulfur on the right, for instance, we see that the outermost valence electrons are much closer to the nucleus, meaning that the nucleus will have a much greater pull on them. And additionally, there's significantly less shielding electrons, which are the electrons in yellow, than in the copper atom, which once again means that the valence electrons are going to experience a lot stronger pull by the nucleus. So in the case of an insulator, if we wanted to dislocate an electron, it would take a massive amount of energy to do so. And so these electrons in sulfur are definitely not free electrons. And thus, a piece of this material would make a really bad conductor. Uh, so yeah, I should also mention that this is really only part of the conductor versus insulator story, but that's okay. This is probably the uh, hardest slide of the entire video also. Uh, so if that was really confusing, I uh, just encourage you to hold on and don't run away just yet. Thanks. All right, so there's definitely a lot going on right now, but let's try to get back into our hydraulic electric circuit analogy. So the pump of the hydraulic circuit is quite a bit like a battery in an electric circuit because just as a pump creates a flow of water, a battery creates a flow of electric charge. Basically, it provides the pushing force which puts electrons in motion. So, if you connect a wire between the positive and negative terminals of a battery, and we know that a piece of conducting wire has a ton of free electrons, then what the battery does is will cause those electrons to flow away from the negative terminal of the battery and into the positive terminal of the battery. And we're going to talk a lot more about that, so if that doesn't make sense, hopefully the next couple of slides will, will clear that up. It's kind of hard to visualize exactly what's going on with the battery, so let's take a look at yet another analogy. So imagine a tube completely filled with marbles, and that's what we have on the bottom over here. Then say we poof another marble into existence and try to add it to the tube. Well, what happens? Well, adding one marble to the tube causes the entire line of marbles to shift by one unit because they all are pushing on each other. And that eventually results in the loss of one marble at the opposite end. And that's this marble over here on the right. Of course, the same thing is going to happen if we try to add a second marble to the tube. They all push on each other, and out pops another marble. Now, imagine that these marbles are instead electrons, and that this actuator piston thing over here is the battery. So, at the negative terminal of a battery, there is a chemical reaction which produces electrons kind of like we produced that marble. And a new electron introduced at the negative terminal is going to push on the nearby free electrons in the external circuit, the electrons nearest to the negative terminal. And those electrons are going to push on their neighbors. And those neighbors are going to push on their neighbors all the way leading up to an electron popping out on the other end of the external circuit and into the positive terminal of the battery. And so that's a little uh, glimpse into how you can think about a battery. Again, it's not perfect, but maybe it gives you a good sense of what's going on. 
the pushing force, quote unquote, felt by the electrons in a wire is due to a difference in electric potential between the two terminals of a battery. So if you connect a conductor between the terminals of a battery, then the electrons are going to move due to a potential difference that exists between the battery's terminals. And we can think of a potential difference in terms of each terminal's so-called tendency to gain electrons. And we hinted at the idea that the negative terminal of a battery wants to give away electrons. So it would have a negative tendency to gain electrons, right? Because it wants to do the opposite of gain electrons. So that's why it's negative on our graph over here on the left. On the other hand, the chemical reaction occurring at the positive terminal wants to gain electrons. So it has a positive tendency to gain electrons. And so if you add these two tendencies together of both terminals, you get the total potential difference of the battery. And it's the total effect that the electrons in your circuit are going to feel. The unit of potential difference is the volt, which is surely a word you've heard before. The symbol we use for the volt is a capital V. Now, more potential difference basically just means more pushing force applied to the free electrons of our circuit. And the more force we apply to those free electrons, the more quickly those electrons are going to flow through our circuit. So we see that potential difference is directly related to the flow of charge. Potential difference is an across variable meaning that it is measured across a device or between two points. You can't have a voltage at a single point in a circuit. That voltage has to be with respect to another point in the circuit. So in our case, on the left over here, we have our battery, and we're saying that the voltage at the positive terminal of the battery is 1.5 volts with respect to the negative terminal of the battery. So you have to have um, two points in the circuit to make a voltage measurement. All right, back to the original water analogy, if you can uh, even think back that far at this point. Let's talk about our new component, the resistor. So just as a valve limits the rate of flow of water, a resistor limits the rate of flow of electrons. And just as we can change how open or closed a valve is, we can choose a resistor which resists the flow of electrons more or less. And without a resistor, the flow of charge is essentially unbounded. And what that means is basically something's going up in smoke and flames. So we need to have some uh, sort of resistor in our circuit to make sure that that doesn't happen. If you think about it, a resistor is really just a poor conductor. It allows the flow of electrons, just not particularly well. And you can think of a piece of conducting wire, like a piece of copper wire, as a beautiful, newly paved, six-lane highway. And you can think of a resistor as a congested city street with construction and detours all over the place. And if the highway hypothetically ran right into the congested city street, then all of the cars on both the highway and in the city will only be able to go as fast as the slowest car in the city. Kind of the same idea in a resistor. If we track the path of a single electron in an electric circuit uh, over here on the right, uh, this brown dot represents an electron moving through our circuit. And we, if we track it as it moves through the conducting wire up top here, we see that it is completely unobstructed. But as soon as it runs into the resistor, 
it starts to hit all sorts of obstacles, making it bounce all over the place until it finally makes its way out of the resistor. So resistance, the term resistance describes how much a resistor pushes back against the flow of charge. The higher the resistance, the harder it is for electrons to move through it, uh, effectively slowing them down. The unit of resistance is the ohm, and it has symbol omega, rather appropriately. A flow of charge, and in this case a flow of electrons, is called an electric current. And electric current has the unit ampere, and it quantifies the rate of flow of charge. So one ampere is defined as one coulomb passing through some slice of a wire in one second. So if we look at this drawing on the right over here, you see our slice in the middle that we're going to take a look at, and you see these electrons moving through that slice. So basically all we have to do is count how many electrons pass through that slice in some amount of time, and then we will know the current. Current is a through variable, which means it describes the quantity of charge which flows through a surface in some amount of time. Just to reiterate that point, let's zoom in to our electric circuit and try counting some coulombs. So each one of these circles um, in our electric circuit here is representing one coulomb of charge. And we know that current is equal to the change in charge through our slice k right here in some amount of time. So let's let this circuit run and we'll find out what our current is. So got the stopwatch up and let's flip the switch. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so five coulombs of charge passed through K in five seconds if we look at our stopwatch. So if we divide five coulombs by five seconds, we know that we have a current of one ampere. Now, of course, if the battery was a higher voltage or the resistance of the resistor was lower, then more charge would pass through K in a given amount of time, and therefore our current would be greater. And of course, the opposite is also true. If our battery voltage was lower or our resistance was higher, then we'd have a lower current. There's a simple relationship we can use to relate voltage, resistance, and current, and it's called Ohm's Law. And what Ohm's Law basically says is that the current through a resistor is equal to the potential difference, or voltage, across that resistor divided by the resistance of that resistor. And that kind of checks out in my mind because we know that current goes up, the rate of flow of charge goes up as we increase the voltage, and we know that current goes down as we increase the resistance. And voltage is on the top, and resistance is on the bottom, so that kind of makes sense. Um, every time you see Ohm's Law written somewhere, you're probably going to see it written as I equals V over R. And Traditionally, the letter I is used to denote current, and that's because C uh, is used for the Coulomb, so it would kind of get confusing. Uh, but we know that the unit of current is still the ampere, right? Okay. So, we can rewrite uh, Ohm's law as I equals V over R, or R equals V over I, 
or v equals i times r. So we can rearrange our equation to solve for any unknown, provided we know two of the three parameters. Let's try an example or two. All right, so for example, if we connect a 30 ohm resistor across the terminals of a 1.5 volt battery, what will be the current? Well, that's pretty easy because we know that I equals V over R. And in this case, the voltage across that resistor is 1.5 volts, and the resistance of that resistor is 30 ohms. Therefore, the current through that resistor has to be 0.05 ampere, which is, for short, 50 milliamps. Now, say we replaced the 30 ohm resistor with a 15 ohm resistor, so effectively halving the resistance. Let's calculate the current. We know I equals V over R. So we put 1.5 over 15 ohms, and we see that we get 0.1 ampere. And so that makes a lot of sense because we halved the amount of resistance, and we doubled the amount of current. And in a similar manner, if we know the current and we know the voltage, then we can determine the value of an unknown resistor. So suppose we have a 12 volt battery and we measure a current of 0.04 amps through the resistor. What must be the value of that resistor? Again, super easy. We just rearrange the equation for R and we, we know that R equals V over I and we know that there's 12 volts across our unknown resistor and a current of 0.04 amps going through that resistor. So therefore, the resistance of that resistor must be 300 ohms. Done. Something that always confused me when I was starting out was, why the heck do we need resistors? Like, why would we ever deliberately slow something down? Well, it turns out that resistors aren't really slowing you down, per se, and they're not innately evil. Uh, resistors really are all about control. And in electronics, resistors are used to precisely control currents and voltages at many different points in a circuit. So some electronic devices have a certain set of voltages and currents they need to operate correctly. And so we use resistors to set the operational point of our circuit and to basically define the functionality of our circuit. For example, there's a device called a transistor, which you may have also heard of, which we can configure to act as an amplifier. And you're probably also familiar with amplifiers, or at least the idea of amplifiers. Um, an audio amplifier, for instance, takes a tiny input signal, say from a microphone, and makes it much larger and much louder. So it turns out we can use a transistor to make that happen. But, but, if we want it to work correctly, we need to carefully select surrounding resistors which will make it function exactly as we want. So maybe you can kind of see why you need resistors in a circuit. And over on the right over here is examples of some resistors you commonly see in electronics ranging from big sizes to small sizes depending on the application, of course. We generally think of resistors as the little devices shown on the previous slide. However, anything which draws a certain amount of current given some input voltage can be modeled as a resistor. 
what I'm trying to say is anything that obeys Ohm's law is, for all intents and purposes, a resistor in the eyes of whatever is powering it. And we call those things, in general, electrical loads. So on the right we have some examples of useful electrical loads, things which consume electric power and do something useful for us. For example, a motor or a light bulb or a smartphone. They all have to be powered by something and to that power source they sorta of kind of look like resistors. Not perfectly, but sort of. Okay, so if we want to make basic electrical measurements in the lab, we can use something called a multimeter. And in this case, we're using a digital multimeter. But an analog multimeter with a moving needle works just the same. So if we want to know the voltage of this battery, we plug one of our test leads into the common jack of the multimeter and the other into the volts jack of the multimeter. And we make sure our range switch, which is this dial right here, is switched to volts. And then we probe across the two terminals of the battery. And we see that this battery is producing a voltage of 1.5 volts between its two terminals. So in this case, this is, must be a standard alkaline battery. And it looks like it's fully charged. Now, if you want to measure current, it's a little bit trickier, but it's, yeah, it's nothing you can't figure out. To measure current, you have to redirect all of the current you want to measure through the meter. Therefore, you have to break the circuit and insert the meter, quote unquote, in series with the circuit. And we have to do this because in order for the meter to count all of the electrons as they pass by, we need to make the meter part of that circuit. And the meter is basically invisible to the rest of the circuit. So the resistor and the battery don't even really know it's there per se. So looking at our test setup, we see that electrons are going to flow out of the negative terminal of the battery through the resistor into the multimeter, get measured, flow out of the multimeter, and back into the positive terminal of the battery. And that's basically how the current measurement is made. But before you measure current, first you have to switch over one of your test leads from the volts jack to the amps jack. Make sure it's in the amps range, uh, the amps jack. And also, uh, you have to switch the range switch to amps, or else this is not going to work. Uh, the reason we need two different jacks on the multimeter in the first place is because measuring current and voltage are fundamentally pretty different from the perspective of the multimeter. Yeah, anyway, that's how you measure voltage and current in a circuit. Well, I think that just about does it for us today. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you made it all the way through this video, that's uh, incredible. I uh, don't know if I'd have that kind of patience, but hopefully you got something out of it. And uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. If you have any questions please leave those below i try to be uh, pretty quick about answering them and uh, yeah let me know okay thanks